to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Stephen Quiring. Dr. Stephen Quiring is a member here of the Department of Geography faculty here at Ohio State. He received his PhD in climatology from the University of Delaware in 2005, and his research emphasizes in hydroclimatology and synoptic climatology. So please welcome Dr. Quiring to the stage. Good afternoon. So this is the dangerous part of the day where lunch is starting to settle in, and uh, so it will not offend me if you stand up and you know stretch, go grab a drink, whatever. Um, there's lots uh, more good uh, speakers following me, so I want you to be well rested at least when they um, come up. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the students who are organizing and putting together and have done all the work for um, our session. And this is my second year at Ohio State, and last year was a real eye-opener when I was here for the first time to see all of the um, preparation and planning and work that went into things behind the scenes. And this year is no different, so I really appreciate the efforts that they do in terms of um, opening up this event and giving us a forum to talk about the things that we love, um, severe weather and uh, climate and its impacts on society. So I'm appreciative of this, this opportunity. And I'd also like to thank the speakers who have taken time out, uh, out of their busy schedules to come to Ohio State and to um, share their research and information with us. So thanks to, to everyone. So my uh, talk switches gears a little bit. It is not particularly relevant to the state of Ohio. And it is not about tornadoes, ward ratios, or lake effect snow. And so um, for the last number of years, uh, I've been working on research related to, in a field that I would call weather um, data analytics or applied climatology, depending on um, what the audience is and how much of a buzzword you want to use. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a climatologist by training. And my research, uh, my doctoral research, was focused on drought. Then I moved to Texas A&M University and spent 11 years there. And in my first semester at Texas A&M, uh, you go to these new faculty orientations, you sit beside various people. One of the people that I sat beside was a civil engineer. And he was working with an interesting data set from an electrical utility, uh, and they were very interested in optimizing their decision-making process, especially with uh, pre-storm planning to improve uh, emergency response, to reduce outage times. And he was like, well, I have the, the civil engineering part down and the modeling part, but really don't know much about weather and uh, climate data sets. Can you help me out? And since that time, we've had the opportunity to work together. He also happens to be affiliated with that school up north. Um, so uh, I list his name here, but not his affiliation, and that's Seth Geikma. Um, and so it's been great working with him, and it's led to a whole bunch of um, related research, including most recently uh, work uh, here in Columbus with AEP. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to work with folks from AEP on not necessarily um, completely hurricane outage prediction, but looking at storm impact prediction, including for AEP Texas and that project. Um, will be spinning up in the next, well, whenever all the contracting and lawyers and stuff are happy. <laughs> so why study power outages? Um, the, in the United States, weather, and particularly weather and vegetation, cause a substantial amount of, of power outages. So about 62% here, based on this Department of Energy data of outages in the United States on an annual basis are because of storm impacts and particularly interactions of weather and vegetation. And so being a climatologist and a geographer, this provides um, ample motivation to bring uh, my skill sets and those of my research team to bear to try and identify the optimal set of environmental variables, the optimal set of meteorological variables, and to couple that with our understanding of the power system to provide uh, data-driven models that can provide advanced warning about the impacts of weather events before they occur. In today's talk, I'll focus on hurricanes, but this is not um, particular to hurricanes in our, our approach, our process, 
is one that can be applied to all types of weather events. Obviously, in a snow event, in um, a straight line wind event, uh, severe weather, there's, there's different kinds of meteorological drivers, but the infrastructure is the same. Um, and sometimes, the, and the environment can be, uh, can differ as well. So what does this kind of look like? Um, here's some examples of hurricane related power outage uh, power outages that have occurred, um, and often, but not always, it's vegetation impacting poles or power lines. Um, there can also be, uh, due to saturated soils, um, uprooting of trees or uh, making the soils less stable, which enhances um, the, the probability of failure. Uh, water is also an issue, so and I'll come back to this in talking about Harvey, um, that flooding is another risk when we think about um, outages and power system damage. So what do things look like over um, the last, uh, over recent times? If we look at a time series, again, uh, data provided by the Department of Energy, we can see that, um, and this is uh, something that we've extended and are working on a paper, what I would call a power outage climatology. If you have any ideas on where I should submit a paper on a power outage climatology, because it's about weather and power outages, so it's a little too applied for meteorological journals, and it's not engineering enough for um, uh, civil engineering and power system journals. So anyways, that's um, one, one thing I'm thinking about. So here's an example of how these weather-related outages have changed over time. And of course, there's a lot of reasons for this, um, but just to say that even though technology has improved, system hardening is continually taking place, we have better forecast models. Um, from a meteorological perspective, we do see increases in the weather-related damages occurring over time. Uh, some of the events that I'm gonna talk about today are hurricanes, and hurricanes are obviously a worst-case scenario in many cases for a power system because they are large events. Um, they're associated with high wind speeds, intense rainfall, storm surge, and so um, literally a perfect storm for power outages. And here's some of the, the recent damages that have occurred, um, the total number of customers, and you can see that in the United States in a typical year, there's about a, a $20 billion economic cost associated with um, power losses, especially weather-related power disruption. So this is a significant impact when we think about the GDP, and it's not just the fact that, hey, when the power's out, your utility meter isn't spinning, so you don't have to send as large a check to AEP. It's the fact that um, a lot of businesses and uh, different sectors of the economy, and for that matter, just uh, health and public safety, transportation, are reliant on electricity, and even though those great mobile devices um, that were referred to earlier, um, those also eventually need to be plugged in, uh, maybe using the outlet underneath your seat in this room. Um, so those are things too that were, um, while we're uh, sort of <coughs> wireless in many cases, we do have to plug in at some point. This uh, problem today is, is not unique to the United States, so a lot of the research that I've done has been with um, utilities in the United States, but we also have a new project starting um, with uh, Wandong Power, and so what's interesting about Wandong Power is that um, when we think about the number of customers that a large utility in the United States might serve, we think about, oh, you know, 3 million, 5 million, 8 million, um, Guangdong Power has 120 million people that they serve, and so um, orders of magnitude larger in terms of uh, their uh, customer base, and of course they also experience um, major damage uh, from uh, tropical cyclones. And so some of the things that are particularly interesting to me if you compare the type of damage, uh, so we have not received detailed data, but just from some of the recent typhoons that they've experienced, they have a lot more transmission damage than we would typically see for hurricanes in the United States. So this looks like a, it'll be an interesting um, and challenging problem for us. So while I lived in Texas, uh, Hurricane Ike occurred. And uh, if you were Center Point Energy, you can see that over the service territory for Center Point Energy, they almost had um, complete uh, power outage take place. And Ike was, uh, 
a big deal, but it's certainly not the only storm that's occurred. And, and while utilities do their best to prepare and to make sure that they have enough crews and resources, there can be um, situations where too many people are brought in and that also costs them money as they're paying um, people through these mutual aid um, double overtime to put them up at the, the Hampton Inn and have a st nice steak dinner. Um, and then if the, the skies are blue and the um, winds are light, uh, they get in their trucks and drive back to upstate New York or wherever they came from. So this is um, both not a situation where automatically, you know, preparing um, for the worst case scenario in every case is, is the best approach. And so they're looking to optimize their preparation in response activities. So the, um, the goals of what we're working on are to provide decision support tools, both for pre-storm preparation and long-term hardening and mitigation. And so one of the things that's happened, for example, in the state of Florida that I'll refer to a little bit later is that following Hurricane Wilma, Florida Power and Light invested billions of dollars in hardening their infrastructure. So replacing wood poles with steel or concrete, um, burying some lines, uh, shoring up uh, their transmission system in preparation for when the next hurricane would come. And obviously um, that did happen. Uh, the last hurricane season was very active and Florida um, was one of those places that uh, saw activity in Florida Power and Light, if you read in the newspaper um, following that event, was not given great press about the number of outages that occurred in the state, and I'll in fact show you a map. Um, and this is in part because uh, the rate payers were saying, well, um, here we put up $3 billion for system hardening to take place, and here's what happened. Um, my power still went out, and I'm not very happy about that. So there um, are ways to use these models for looking at improving long-term risk and resilience, determining optimal um, vegetation management schedules, where hardening activity should take place. Um, that isn't going to prevent a hurricane from occurring, but it can reduce um, the impacts and in, uh, increase uh, how quickly things can be restored. So while the work that we're doing, looking at the impacts of weather and climate on um, electrical utilities is kind of unique to one sector, um, these same types of data-driven uh, applied climate tools can be used in a lot of different uh, applications. And so um, I just want to focus on here kind of what the decision-making timeline looks like uh, in the case of a hurricane for other weather events with sort of different lead times um, this could adjust a bit but in the case of hurricanes uh, often on the at the outset you might have about five days before the event hopefully have some advance notice most um, decisions are made in the two to three um, day lead time and then in the day before it's kind of uh, shelter in place um, at that point you don't want your crews driving down i-10 um, as the outer rain bands are making uh, landfall and so um, that's there's a sort of finite window in which um, predictions are made and of course things can change quite a bit in terms of track and intensity prior to landfall and so this uh, is one of the challenges that's present. So um, some of the modeling that we've done is uh, to focus on um, providing information for this longer, these longer time scales. Some of it's on the shorter time scales, the three days in advance of a storm. And then there's, of course, seasonal type planning and preparation that could be done. I'll mostly talk about the, the pre-storm the pre planning, the short time scales today. So when I was hired at Ohio State, one of the reasons that I um, came here was uh, it was part of one of the discovery themes. Um, and that discovery theme is translational data analytics. And so Ohio State has a translational data analytics institute. There are a number of faculty across campus who are unified under this umbrella to look at ways of bringing um, these tools to bear on a variety of problems. So yesterday I had a chance to 
talk to a, a class in the Fisher Business School, and it's a business analytics class, so they're accounting majors or um, other business majors, but they're looking at um, building up their tool set and skills in the data analytics arena. So there's lots of applications for this. So why, are, why is this particular problem one that I would kind of lump underneath that um, analytics umbrella? And the first is because of the volume of data. So this may um, not be a surprise to those of us who work in the atmospheric science field. Obviously, as Philip just mentioned, high performance computing is extremely important. Data volumes can be really large. And that's also the case with electrical utilities where there's um, a lot of information about their system and their customers and their crews and that information is changing um, in uh, moment to moment and we might want to include that in kind of the model so this is for one particular utility that we've worked with um, showing their different numbers of trees and poles and transformers and we have data about each one of these elements in the model that we're trying to use to better more accurately predict what's going on. Second motivation for taking an analytics-based approach as compared to a fragility curve, a, a typical civil engineering type approach, um, is the variety of data sets. So fragility of curves are based on um, gust wind speed and the probability of, let's say, a pole failing under a wind of a particular velocity. That's great. Um, except that poles obviously are also responding to a lot of other factors like the saturation of the soil and um, how heavy are the rains and what kind of vegetation is around them and when were they last maintained and so there's a large variety of different data sets that we incorporate. And this shows some examples, just kind of a typical GIS. And so um, being in a geography department, that's one of the, the core skills I want my graduate students to have is geospatial analysis to work with data sets of a variety of different types. So radar data, land use land cover data, soils data, infrastructure data, and the like. Uh, another reason that the analytics-based approach is optimal for these kinds of models is because of the nonlinear relationships. And so, um, while it's um, helpful to build a linear or multiple linear regression where you assume that um, the predictor variables are having a linear influence on the response, if we look at the true relationships, these are often nonlinear. So these are partial dependence plots that come out of uh, a random forest package in R where we look at the incremental influence of an individual variable, in this case, um, we have uh, soil moisture and the root zone depth, oh, no, sorry, maximum wind gust and uh, the depth of the root zone, depth of the soil. On, and these are both on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we have the uh, response in terms of outages. And so both, neither one of these graphs uh, would a linear fit um, do, do it justice. Finally, um, from a statistical point, this is kind of a a little bit of a, a tangent, but the data are very zero inflated. So we're trying to, with extreme events, separate out signal and isolate those locations where there's going to be a large impact, knowing that in a large diverse um, utility service territory, there's many places that won't have power outages. We've gone this entire day, the power's not gone off. That's not unusual. Um, so if you predict zero power outages for most locations, you're going to be right 98, 99% of the time. But a model predicting zero, it's not going to cost you very much to build that. And you're going to have a lot of difficulty selling that as a useful decision-making product. So we want to make sure that we, our model is good at predicting zeros, but also good at predicting the non-zero events. And when we have a data set that has a lot of zeros, we have to treat it appropriately, and so these are sometimes called zero inflated data sets, and there's a whole bunch of statistical literature that is not good for a Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. to talk about, but nonetheless, um, that's another reason. So how do we go about doing this? So our approach uh, involves using environmental data, so things on soil moisture and recent precipitation, land use, land cover, soils, information on the power system. So this is the exposure of the system to the weather-related risk, and also the hazard to the system from the meteorological event itself. 
So this is why an interdisciplinary process, uh, project or team is necessary to really solve this, because we want state-of-the-art information on each one of these components. And um, we want to make sure we're using the most accurate forecasts, the most appropriate for those locations, uh, adequately capturing the uncertainty in those predictions and putting things together in the right way. Um, so for hurricanes, we have a parametric wind field model that we use um, that predicts the maximum winds and duration of strong winds at each individual location. We can also um, replace that wind field model with other things like Hurricane Wharf or whatever someone's preferred um, uh, wind speed forecast would be. And in fact, the best approach is actually to use multiple different um, approaches for estimating all of those meteorological variables at each, at each location. Um, in terms of what we're modeling, we have focused, depending on the uh, question of interest, in some cases decisions are driven by the number of people without power. So if your phone's ringing off the hook and there's a large number of customers whose uh, meter is out, that is what's driving decisions. But from a repair standpoint, from a, a, a crew response standpoint, it's actually more um, the trouble spots or places where there's damage that a crew actually has to go and physically do something, replace a transformer, um, replace a line, um, take vegetation off of something. And so um, that's another, the, the damage models is another place we've worked. And then if you're thinking about it from a customer experience perspective, when your power goes out, you wanna know how long is this gonna be? Is this a few minutes? No problem, I can wait. I really wish my garage door had a battery backup so I could open the garage door and go <laughs> get a Miller Lite or whatever. Or is this gonna be a really long time? Like, oh man, I wish I didn't have 30 gallons of ice cream in my freezer, I better have a party so that we don't doesn't all get spoiled. And so you want to make um, informed decisions based on that estimated time of restoration. And so that's another place, outage duration, that we've done some modeling. Our typical approach is um, data-driven. So these data analytics models require um, as large a possible data set of a variety of different conditions of past storm events so that we can adequately and accurately train a model. We also want to use that data that the model has not seen to assess the performance of the model. So doing a holdout validation, we're using um, a, a data set that is um, so far unseen by the model so we can get a fair assessment of, of model accuracy. So um, I'll show you some models. So these are, uh, the geography is obscured here. So this is data provided by uh, a major investor owned Gulf Coast utility who wishes to remain anonymous. So I can't tell you exactly where it is, but it's in the Gulf Coast. And they provide us with nice detailed data, 8,000 foot by 12,000 foot grid cells over their service territory. They um, took a major hit from a variety of hurricanes in the last number of years. And so this is using utility specific data and two different models, um, a generalized linear model, a generalized additive model. And this is showing the number of um, customers out at each location within their uh, one uh, state service territory. And so in this case, um, using their detailed information, we can do pretty well. Um, Future, uh, further work on that, so one of uh, my collaborators, his PhD student, uh, while he was at Johns Hopkins, developed a better model um, based on random forest that uses six covariates, so it was a much simpler model and performed as well or better, and it used things like time since last uh, uh, trim, and so the vegetation management and tree trimming on each circuit was turned out to be a really important variable that improved the model accuracy. So, that, so that's great. Um, we have models that work really well for specific utilities when they provide us with all of their data. But what about for all the utilities not providing us with data? And so what I'm going to talk about now is a project that's currently ongoing uh, through the Department of Energy's Grid Modernization Lab Call. This is in collaboration with um, Los Alamos National Lab, and we are um, developing a model for the United States at 250 meter resolution. And remember, Philip said you're supposed to laugh when people say things that are uh, good dissertation topics. So 250 meter resolution, yes, they want that um, resolution over the United States 
for utilities that we have none of their data. So it's pretty much impossible. Um, and this is the project that we've been working on for the last few years. We're having a, uh, a show and tell. So there were two labs independently uh, working on models and um, the, uh, I guess, rubber hits the road at the end of this month when we both uh, showcase the accuracy of our results and the Department of Energy picks a winner, which is whoever, the, the lab that'll get the funding for the next go round um, to further improve the model and implement it operationally. And so in this case, the challenge is that we can only use publicly available data sets and that we need to be able to run it um, in near real time over anywhere in the continental United States where hurricanes might make landfall. Um, and so this is the problem of generalization. Taking what we would really like is specific information about vegetation management and the number of customers and um, how old are your poles and how old are your transformers and how often do you send out uh, crews to, to trim and those kind of things, but we'd have none of that. So we have publicly available data sets and um, uh, so this is what our model currently looks like. We've been running it for um, a number of years for different events. These, uh, in this case, we do not have any utility specific data from any of the places shown here. The polygons that are um, colored in are a little bit odd in their shape because they're based on census tracts. So we're using population data as a proxy for customers. So higher population densities, meaning places where there are potentially more customer meters at risk. Um, using our Winfield model, using a lot of environmental variables, and then um, putting these out uh, for consumption and critique. Um, and so how good is a model like this? How well can it do at um, predicting things when we don't have a lot of data? Um, you'll be surprised that the, one of the biggest challenges is not actually the fact that we don't have good predictor variables to train the model, it's that it's almost impossible to validate it. And so, again, unless you sign an NDA um, or, uh, with every utility company, the chances of them providing you with all of their um, highly detailed 250 meter or individual customer meters out for any given storm so you can actually determine how well your model is doing is uh, very unlikely to happen. Um, and so we are using uh, publicly available data sets and that's great except for the fact that the publicly available data sets um, disagree with each other it often in quite uh, impressively large ways. So there is a data set called Eagle Eye, which um, is one of the, the National Labs um, scrapes public facing utility web pages, right? So if you're interested in what outages are currently occurring in um, First Energy or AP territory, you can go onto their website, you can see a map, it'll show you for um, various geographic resolutions. So um, enterprising individuals can also collect that data. And so that's one source of information. Um, how reliable that source is and how accurate those scrapers are is, is, is a question. Um, for uh, Harvey, for example, in Texas, uh, Eagle Eye data uh, suggested that there were um, 48,000 power outages, something like that. So um, not, not so helpful, because that was really, really wrong. Um, and there's also other sources of information. So this is a, a Department of Energy report um, that we are using. So this um, gives uh, peak outages for each uh, state, for each day. And this is something that we can compare our model against. And so here's um, our validation results. So using the spatially generalized uh, hurricane outage prediction model, the orange um, lines are using uh, the NLDAS soil moisture. The blue lines are using the NASA SMAP um, soil moisture product. So just different input variables that we are testing. The black line is uh, the peak um, number of outages per state. And uh, the colored bars are our prediction of the... Um, so we predicted each census tract, the fraction of customers without power, and then roll that up. So. When you disaggregate it spatially, it doesn't look so good. And even if you disaggregate it at the, sp at the state level, it doesn't look very good. 
Um, if you roll up all of those numbers, then okay, the overall number is relatively close to um, what happened for these four states. And you'll note that Florida's not on here, even though Matthew definitely um, played an impact in Florida. So here again is our uh, track for reminding you. And there's a reason, there's issues with the data from Florida, so we can't even put it on this particular atmospheric science. Philip was referring to the poor graduate students. One of the undergraduate students at Ohio State has the um, joy of taking paper forms um, from the state of Florida, from their emergency management, and digitizing them. Um, and unfortunately, Julia had to go catch a plane to somewhere uh, exciting, so she's not here. But I told her that if there are any hard questions, I would send them to her, so you can if you know who that is. So here, here's the results of her work. So this is um, where we had to use CERT data from the state, and now we can have it at the county level. Um, the actual is on uh, the left-hand side, the, the predicted is on the right-hand side, and you can see that there's some pretty large um, differences that maybe at first blush the spatial pattern looks okay, um, but certainly the overall predictions are not correct. And so one question is, well, why doesn't the model do so well? Um, I'll show you another example and then I'll... Uh, so for a while, with our spatially generalized model, uh, we had developed it in you know, 2015, eh, not that exciting, 2016, okay, well, we had Matthew. Uh, 2017, okay, well, this now is more relevant topic because there's a lot, there was a lot of impact in the United States. Um, and one of those storms that I will highlight here briefly is, is Harvey. Um, and so Harvey presented a unique challenge when it came to um, forecasting because it was really, uh, in some ways, a, a, had two different identities. So there was a wind-driven, um, typical hurricane landfall, and then there was what happened in the city of Houston. Both of those things caused a tremendous number of outages. Our model's trained on maximum wind speed and duration of strong winds. It's not trained um, to do inland flooding and to anticipate um, the impacts of 30 to 45 inches of rain. Um, so here's uh, an image right around landfall, landfall near Rockport, Texas, um, a place that I actually visited quite frequently while I was at Texas A&M. We had a field course where we took students um, to that area. Unfortunately, Rockport uh, took the uh, brunt of this uh, intense storm. And um, so here's what our predictions look like uh, about 33 hours before landfall. And so, um, there are certainly some issues with the spatial pattern. The intensity of outages goes a little bit too far inland, and um, but nonetheless, and things here you can see where the storm was predicted to kind of turn into um, an extra tropical uh, low and uh, kind of peter out. And if you look at the the Houston area, oh, nothing's really going on. So hey, great. Um, and then, of course, uh, as um, the forecast proceeded, so nine hours before landfall, if we run the, the storm, tr uh, our model with that storm track, now we can see that, oh, okay, the hurricane's going to move back into the Gulf and kind of stall out, and okay, now the Houston area is starting to see some forecast impacts, um, and we can have a time series animation here. So this shows on the, the left-hand side um, how the number of outages changed over time. So just through those three animations, you can see that the total number of customers predicted to be affected jumped from a few hundred thousand up. And these uh, occurred in that, remember the prime decision-making time is two or three days in advance. And this increase is uh, in the less than one day in advance. Um, and of course the other issue is, I'll skip this one for now, the other issue is this. So um, this, I like this graphic because it shows the total number of, of square miles that receive different amounts of precipitation. If you've ever been to Houston, there's a reason why they call it the Bayou City. Um, it is very low, it is built on a swamp, and um, it's not really good for draining water, especially catastrophic amounts of rainfall like this. Um, and so 
Harvey, one of the wettest storms. And as a result, our model doesn't really do very well at picking up what's going on in the city of Houston. That if we look at our validation, we can say, okay, great. It um, did reasonably well in the less populated parts of Texas, in the greater Rockport area, where we had strong winds and therefore lots of direct infrastructure damage. Not so well where we had uh, inland flooding being the primary driver as opposed to wind speed. That's not surprising since um, the model doesn't include uh, a inland flooding component, the spatially generalized model at least. All right, so I'm gonna skip through this one because I know I'm running out of time and I don't wanna make the students mad at me since some of them are in my class. Um, but just to show you, so um, here is Hurricane Irma again, thanks to Julia for um, coding this data in. Um, if you remember Matthew, the model was over predicting. Irma, uh, well, <laughs> why is all of the eastern um, part of Florida uh, in red based on the state level? So this is if you can trust the state level county by county outage reports. Um, and that there's a significant under prediction of the number of outages. And in fact, it's even more interesting if you look at this over time and so this points to another issue with the outage data. We are predicting outages in the distribution system. If there's a transmission outage, that takes out a lot of, a lot of customers, and it may take out customers that are not particularly experiencing strong winds or impactful weather at that period of time. And so um, there are also, this is also why I mentioned the, the system hardening. Uh, the, the impact of Irma on uh, the utilities in the state of Florida was kind of out of proportion with what, you, what our model would have anticipated given a storm of that velocity. And so that just raises questions. I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, just saying our model was wrong. This is what actually happened to the best of our knowledge. Um, and it's really hard to get all of those factors in. So we're continuing to work on that. All right, so go to some concluding thoughts. Um, so one of the things that I have not talked about is uh, how do we actually better account for this uncertainty? So we're doing things like running our power outage model a thousand times, using the Monte Carlo wind speed probability products. So we get a probabilistic distribution of outages um, that we are trying to get more variables into the model. So things like storm surge and inland flooding, which are not currently in the spatially generalized version, our utility specific partners benefit from more detailed modeling um, in that respect. Um, and then just sort of um, point to some of the new projects. So as a um, faculty and researcher, uh, I get really interested in this problem because it's very difficult. And it's, uh, it's really interesting because it requires collaboration with a large number of different disciplines, um, gives me a chance to get students involved in the work, and I'm looking forward to continuing to improve these models um, to support emergency management and planning operations. Thanks for your attention. No one's here to say I can't take a question, so. Uh, I need to preface my question in a second. Uh, I was the emergency management director here in Franklin County in the 90s and into the early 2000s. And I had a chance to meet with uh, two uh, people from AEP uh, right before Y2K, and I know some people don't understand Y2K. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about transmission lines and talked about the availability of electricity in case there was a situation like y or a terrorist incident or something else. And I made the comment then about why are you still using 100-year-old technology with hard wires over long distances and not looking at something more of a neighborhood approach or a small city approach or however that would work. And some of, the, some of the data you're looking at here is still looking at that same old technology that the electric companies use. Are you looking at all at recommending some other types of transmission or other types of, of electrical use? So that's a little outside of my area of expertise, but I do know that um, some of the utilities that we work with are very interested in it, uh, implementing things like microgrids, distributed generation, 
in other ways. Um, uh, the, the restoration has improved through automated switching and, and other things that can be used to um, provide more resilience to the system. So there absolutely is that point. I think the other part of it is that there is this, um, uh, there's lots of great ideas that of things that could be done, but it's it's about the dollars, and so where do those funds come from to do, like in Houston, they looked at um, undergrounding all the line after Ike, and that, and it, the, I forget what the number was, but we'll call it 30 billion or something like that to bury all the lines for the city of Houston, so. But that speeds into follow-up. What about a return on investment? How much does it cost to them to reconstitute an electric system a la Puerto Rico than it would be to to maybe do some of those new technologies? Yeah, good question. I'll defer to my friends from AEP who are here. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a conversation for the break, but it's a great question, yes. I think we are, we are real tight on time, so I think we should 